Good morning and welcome! I'm Fly and today I'm going to be talking about this thing, Scythe. Okay, so with Expeditions announced, which is the sequel to Scythe, I thought this might be a good time to talk a little bit about and tell you what I think about this game. No, I won't be teaching anyone anything new here. The game has been around for, what, seven years now? and uh, there's enough contents already out there. I'll just give you a quick overview of the game if you don't know it yet, and then we'll come back. This is a 1-5 to five player game designed by Jamie Stegmaier and published by Stonemaier Games, and plays in about 30 minutes per player. This is a midweight Euro game, set in an alternate history in the 1920s, where the Great War still wages on, and several factions vie for control and be the richest and most powerful faction in Eastern Europa. You start out by placing the game board in the middle of the table, each player picks a faction and takes the matching faction board and then you deal one random player board to every player, which you'll place like this. Then you collect all components in your color and fill your player board like so. You ready up each deck of cards, set the popularity and power tracks. Each player starts with two objective cards, this much money and this many combat cards. You place your hero and two workers on the board and you're set to go. In this game you'll be exploring, producing resources and building stuff so you can generate money and it's all happening in your player board. Your player board is split into four different sections. For each section there's a top row action and a bottom row action. For each action you might have a cost listed in red and then a benefit listed in green. On your turn you're going to move your pawn to a different section than the turn before. And then you can do the top row action, the bottom row action or both. If you choose to do both you must do the top row action first and then the bottom row action by paying a cost in red, if any, and then receiving the benefit in green. So typically the top row actions will allow you to move and produce resources and the bottom row actions will convert those resources in something else. There are four different resources. Wood lets you build structures on the map, thus permanently opening an ongoing benefit every time you do this top row action. Food lets you enlist by removing one of these discs on the bottom to one of these one-time bonus on your faction board. Also revealing an ongoing effect, meaning when you, or one of your neighbors, does this bottom action, you get the benefit listed on the green on the right. Metal is used to deploy mechs onto the board. They serve two main purposes, which is carrying workers around and combat. And depending on where you took the mech from, your hero and mechs also get this ongoing ability you just uncovered. Oil lets you take the upgrade action, in which you pick up any cube from the top row and place it anywhere in the bottom row red boxes. This not only reduces the cost of the bottom row actions, but it also increases the benefit of the top row action where you just remove the cube from. Throughout the game you'll also be exploring. When you end your movement in the same space as another player's combat unit, combat happens. And the way you resolve it, it's very simple. Each player picks up one of these dials, then you look at where you are on the power track. That tells you how much you can spend, so each player secretly sets your value between 0 and 7. Even though you can have more power, 7 is the max you can spend. After which, both players reveal simultaneously and the player with the highest value wins the combat. This is the part in which you can also use combat cards to help you during combat. The loser gets all their units in that space sent back home, and for each worker that the attacker sent home, they lose one popularity. Popularity is how much you are beloved by the people, and this is important, because it will serve as a multiplier by the end of the game. And the game goes on and on like this, when each player completes one of these goals up here on the Star Trek, by, say, having four max on the board, or building their four structures, you place a star on those spots. When one player places their sixth star, the game ends immediately, and a few things will be converted into money by then, and the player with the most money wins the game. Alright, so what this game is, is an efficiency puzzle. This is a, an engine building slash action selection efficiency puzzle, because there's actually a sequence of actions you can do that will optimize your gameplay. So I'm playing this faction with that player board, so I know I have to produce, then I'll trade, then I'll produce again, which will allow me to do the bottom row action, which is in lists, and that will be true every time you play this faction with that player board, until you free yourself from your little peninsula, which should be around 30% into the game, as you're very limited in the area where you start and you want to spread out as fast as possible. And by then, there will be no guide that helps you, because you'll have to react to what the other players will be doing, which, depending on the group, 
may or may not be adverse to your strategy. As I've played games of this where there wasn't a single combat at all and everyone still enjoyed themselves. However, you need to be ready for anything, because you don't know the other player's intentions. So the way you play a faction with a given player board will never be the same. And speaking of combat, I myself have never been much for conflicts really, but the combat in this game makes for about 20% of it, which for me is just about right. It's not always the, um, the combat itself, it's more of a threat that it's always hanging in the air. And there's no luck in combat, like in most games of this genre. In fact, there's hardly any luck at all in the game. The only luck comes from the encounter card draws, which you'll be doing one, maybe two, three times at most during the game. Now, is it balanced? Mostly, yes. And I say mostly because some factions might feel more powerful than others, depending on which other factions are playing. Because you see, uh, if both your neighboring factions are on the board, you will, you will feel more constricted to what you can do, which is true, because that is the way the game is designed. And some might say there are factions that work better with certain player boards, to which I say, you gotta make do with what you have, because so will everyone else. However, there are actually a couple of faction slash player board combinations that have been officially banned because they are actually overpowered, which is uh, Roosevelt faction with the uh, industrial player board and uh, Crimea with patriotic player board. And the game can end abruptly. If you're not paying attention to what the other players are doing, you might not even know it's coming. Because you see someone has three stars up there on the star track and you think, okay, we're halfway into the game. You might not be, because it's quite easy to make 3 stars in one turn. 4 even. 5! If the planets are aligned and the Earth is spinning in the right direction, it's even possible to make 6 stars in one turn. But yeah, that, that'll... forget it, that'll never happen. The rulebook is very clean, the artwork is amazing, Jaeger Brozalski managed to create this fantastic alternative world. Production is great, just keep in mind that most of the components I've shown you here are deluxe, but you do get a lot of value for what you pay for this game. Now let's talk about expansions really quick. So this one, Invaders from Afar, just adds two new factions which are slightly harder to play than the base ones, um, which also increases the player count up to seven, which by the way, you don't play this game at seven ever, not even six, four is a sweet spot. Maybe five at most. This expansion, the Wind Gambit, adds a new vehicle, the Airships which sounds really cool, but it's just okay. Um, I found out that in most games that I put this in, most people didn't even make use of them. They're more of a hassle than an advantage. And this expansion also comes with a module that introduces new uh, end game triggering conditions. That's cool. And this expansion is one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. The Rise of Fenris introduces a campaign mode. It's not legacy, it can be reset after playing, and you, you can even use pretty much everything that's inside here in a regular game of sides. Inside here, besides an amazing story and gameplay elements, there's a bunch of modules you can mix and match pretty much however you see fit. Okay, so from the way I've been talking about the game, I might make it sound that the game is just okay. Well, it's not. It's amazing. I mean, yes, there are a few minor issues, but you do have to play this game a lot for them to stand out. There's even an expansion that addresses to those, which is the modular boards, which gives the game a huge variability. But you don't need that, again, you'll have to play this game a lot. So for me, this game is an 8.5 out of 10. It's a great game, okay? But with this expansion, it's a 10 out of 10. It is that good. This is one of my favorite games of all time. And that is that. What do you think about this game? I know some people love it, others despise it, it's just what it is. I'll be talking more about Expeditions, the sequel to Scythe, once it is released. Until then, I hope you enjoyed it, thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and until next time.